Okay, so today uh, we're going to talk about dye, and particularly we're going to talk about different kinds of things that you can find in your home and out around in nature that you can use to dye your fabric samples for your dye book, which I will talk about your dye book at the end of this lecture. Okay, so first let's talk about what dye bases make what color choices. Okay, um, another thing to start off thinking about is the rich history of dye. So I'm going to scan some excerpts from you from some books that I really like that I think are pretty um, interesting and illuminating in this history. The first one is this book, which is called uh, Perfect Red. Um, and the second is The Secret Lives of Color. So I'll add those a little later this week, but there are lots of books out there that are about the history of dye making and the history of dyeing as a profession. And it's kind of an integral part of um, the historic fabric of um, particularly in, in Western history in Europe and in the conquest of the Americas and the um, subsequent horrors and colonization that happened there. Um, but some of the things that came out of that were um, different uh, dye bases, different materials for dye. And your clothing and what color they were particularly was a symbol of status in, um, in Europe in the Middle Ages and also in the Renaissance up through the Baroque. So if you could find a dye base that would make a really rich, vibrant red that would stay, that would be fast, is what we call that when the dye will stay, it's called fast, um, or a rich purple, for example, those were very highly sought after things. Those were very sought after colors. And the techniques that were used to create those dyes were um, highly guarded secrets. People got murdered over these things. So it's, it's kind of a fascinating history. We're not gonna talk about the history of dyeing today. Today, we're going to talk about actual dyeing and how to do it and how to, how to um, dye in our kitchen, kitchen sink dyeing, basically. Okay, so let's talk about what dye bases make what colors. Um, first of all, on all of these, as I um, alluded to or said in the EcoPrint and Rust Transfer um, lecture, it, you, you can't guarantee what color you're going to get. Um, there's just a lot of factors and there's a lot of things that can impact what kind of color you get. Dyeing is very difficult, it's very unpredictable unless you get to an industrial level where everything's synthesized. So take all this with a grain of salt. This is why we do a dye book to do lots of experimenting so we can figure out what works and what does, doesn't. But generally this list of things will give you something in the red pink family. Getting a true red is quite difficult. Um, there's all different shades of pink that you get from this. Getting a uh, true red that is fast, that holds, is tricky. So here are some things that I have done that result in reds or pinks. Beets, um, the leaves or the root, bamboo, oddly enough, um, cherry, any red uh, red Kool-Aid, cherry, strawberry, any of those. Cherry seems to work a little bit better than strawberry. Uh, red food coloring. Kool-Aid and food coloring work better on protein fibers like wool um, than they do on plant fibers. Uh, sumac berries, you can find sumac berries around here. Those will turn something kind of a kind of a rosy pink. Uh, huckleberries, pokeweed berries. Pokeweed pe berries, you sometimes get kind of a lavendery purple, but you can also get a pink, uh, kind of a rich pink color. Daylilies, um, basil leaves. Daylilies, be careful if you have cats. Uh, all lilies are extremely poisonous to cats, not just them eating it, but if they like rub the pollen and stuff on their little kitty faces, very bad for them. So be careful if you use daylilies and day lilies or lilies and anything. Basil leaves will give you kind of a rosy pink. Avocado skins and seeds will give you um, a darker pink. Uh, cherries, red and pink roses, though it's usually fairly faint. Bougainvillea, uh, lavender, and hibiscus are all things that will give you red or pink. Also locally, if you're familiar with bloodroot, um, I'll post a picture of what that looks like. We're out of season for it. I usually just share it in the spring semester. But if you dig up uh, bloodroot and crush up the root, you can dye with that as well. There's also a bunch of different kinds of mushrooms and lichens that you can dye with. 
Um, that's a separate thing that I'll talk to you about a little later. Okay, blue and purple. Um, black beans consistently give a really nice kind of periwinkle blue. Um, red cabbage, hyacinth flowers, blueberries, indigo, woad you can get at the health food store, elderberries. Elderberries can run a little bit um, a little bit warmer of a purple than these other ones. Red mulberries, dogwood bark, purple grapes, sometimes those really dark black purple grapes do the best, and red wine. Yellow, gold, and orange. Onion skins, um, the red onion skins tend to give you more of a green. Uh, eucalyptus, the leaves and the bark, the bark has more tannin so it works a little better. Butternut squash husks, red clover, celery leaves, bay leaves. Turmeric is one of the most reliable dyes. It will always, this is turmeric in the, in the image here, turmeric will pretty much always give you a very bright yellow. Uh, St. John's wort, which you can get at the health food store. Dandelion, the leaves and the flowers work. The roots kind of, but it's a lot lighter of a hue. Paprika gives you a nice uh, kind of rusty orange. Lilac twigs, you have to grind those up a little bit. Queen Anne's lace roots, marigolds, and barberry roots. For green, uh, artichokes, it's a pretty subtle green. Spinach can give you a nice dark green. Sorrel roots, peppermint leaves, lilac flowers, even though they're purple, they make a green dye. Snapdragons, grass, especially if you grind it up. Nettles, uh, plantain, and peach leaves. Uh, brown and tan, First of all, you can get brown and tan by mixing different colors. Color theory works in dyeing too. Um, but coffee, walnut hulls. Walnut is quite reliable for getting a nice deep brown. Um, old tea bags, eucalyptus, particularly the leaves, dandelion roots, um, but sometimes it's kind of a pale color and sometimes it's a pale yellow. Um, oak bark and acorns. Black is very hard to get. Um, if you need black, just buy it. <laughs> it's really difficult to get. Um, iris root will give you a nice gray. India ink, if you just let it soak forever, sometimes you get black or almost black. And sometimes you can get close to black. It's like a brown black with walnut hulls. But black is very difficult. It's a very difficult color to dye. Even if you buy black writ dye, like commercial dye, and dye something black with it, it usually turns kind of a purple color. So if you need something to be black, I recommend just buying something that is already black because it is, in my experience, the hardest color to get. Okay, so now you have these lists of things that you can use, and that's not the end-all be-all list. You can try anything in your spice cabinet. You can try any kinds of vegetable, um, leftover vegetable bits, anything like this. Um, but those are some things that I've tried that do work. So before you start the dyeing process, you want to get your fabric ready. So if you think back to the EcoPrint and the rust transfer, we had a little prep that we did with the fabric to make that work better. The same is true for dyeing. So you want to wash your fabric, but you can leave it damp. You don't want to dry it. We like for it to be wet. It's, it's easier to work with. Then you prepare your fixative or mordant. You can use the mordant that you created for your EcoPrint fabric with the rusty metal. You could also use salt or vinegar alone. Um, for berries and anything that's a soft fruit, you want to use salt. And for any other plant materials like leaves or bark or flowers, you want to use vinegar. I'm not totally sure why, I am not a scientist, but salt works better with soft fruits. Um, so here are some proportions. If you're using salt, dissolve half a cup of salt into eight cups of water. For vinegar, you're going to blend one part white vinegar to four parts cold water. Okay, here are some basic home dyeing techniques. And again, when you're doing this and you're using heat, make sure that you pay attention to it so that you don't catch anything on fire because I have had that ex uh, happen with a student in the past. Um, okay, so you're going to put your dye base, your plant material, or whatever you're dyeing with, in a large non-reactive pot. What do I mean by non-reactive? I mean that some of you are probably ceramicists, and you do not want to try to do this in your beautiful terracotta pot, because that is going to influence the color that we get. So we want something that's like 
stainless steel or maybe something that's glass. You just don't want something that's porous or something that has, um, that might deposit any kind of color or matter into what you're working with. Um, remember when you're doing this, the dye can stain some pots um, and it also could stain some spoons. Like if you have a treasured wooden spoon that your grandmother gave you, probably don't stick that in your dye bath as it will become whatever color you're dyeing it. Um, so use things that, that it's okay if they stain a little bit. Stainless steel doesn't usually stain, thus the stainless steel. Um, you're going to fill the pot with twice as much water as plant material. So you, you, that's a general rule. You can play with this. You can alter this proportion after you've tried it. But to get like a baseline on what the dye is going to do, my general rule is twice as much water to plant base and then I'll kind of tinker with it. Like if it comes out lighter than I wanted, I'll go back, do it again, add more plant base. If it comes out darker, dilute it with water, that kind of thing. Um, okay, then you're going to simmer it for, uh, I usually do like an hour. You can do less time than this. Um, this isn't boiling, this is just lightly simmering, okay? And you want for the water to take on the color of the dye base. You wanna get a pretty nice concentrated looking color. Um, the dyed fabric is going to turn out lighter than the color the water is. So if you want it really dark, you need to get a really dark color, okay? Um, you're gonna strain out the plant material but keep the liquid in the pot. If you leave the plant material in, that's okay. It's just that it's gonna stick all over your fabric and can make it kind of uneven looking. Um, so then you're gonna put the fabric back in the dye bath and you slowly wanna bring it up to a boil. Then you're going to turn it down to a simmer and let it simmer for another hour. Um, and you wanna come in and stir it every once in a while. That's gonna help the dye soak in evenly across the fabric so that it's not, um, just concentrating on one area. That also means that it's not sticking to the bottom or the side of the pan where it might singe, okay? Check your fabric. Uh, it will be lighter when it dries. An hour should produce a pretty nice color, but darker hues can be achieved by allowing it to sit longer, even overnight. Now, if you are going to let it sit overnight, turn the heat off. Don't leave something on heat overnight, please. I do not want you to burn anything down, okay? Um, then you're gonna turn the pot off allow the fabric to sit in the warm water as long as needed. So you can let it sit, you can let it sit for days if you want, it's up to you. Um, when you get the color you want, take the fabric out and you're gonna rinse it in cold water with salt. The color will run some, it's just like when you get your hair dyed and then you go take a shower the first time and it runs a little bit, right? So you expect the color to run some as the excess dye is washed out and then you let it dry. Now, if you are worried and you want the color to be darker, if this isn't something you're going to wear, you can just let it dry with the dye base without rinsing it. It makes the fabric a little bit more stiff, a little bit harder to work with, and it can make it a little bit uneven in tone. But if you're trying to get a really rich color, and the reason I say if it's not something you're gonna wear, because if you're gonna wear it and you don't rinse the excess dye, it will impart dye on your skin and, and dye you whatever color it is. But, if it's not something you're gonna wear and you want it to have a more rich color, you don't necessarily have to rinse it if you're okay with it being stiff and perhaps being a little bit uneven in color. Okay, here's some other tips and tricks. Heat affects how dye absorbs into fabric. So some dye bases work better if you simmer the dye base and the fabric together over heat and you don't uh, strain out your dye base. Um, I recommend experimenting with different bases at different temperatures and recording the difference in your dye book. Um, the amount of base materials you use also impacts the color that you're going to end up with. You can also combine base materials to create variance in hue. What happens almost every semester when people see how good and consistent turmeric is, they tend to throw turmeric into more subtle dyes to try to pump up the volume a little bit and add some brightness. But you can mix, you can Try a couple of different dye bases and then try mixing some of them together. You just want to make notes and write down everything that you do. Protein and plant fiber um, take dye differently. Synthetics, if you use any synthetics for projects, they take dye the least well usually. Um, so I make you test both protein and plant fibers for your dye book. But if you are working on a project and you know you're going to use a synthetic material, uh, test that too. Go ahead and test that and, and that way you have that as a reference as well. 
Um, rinsing in cold salt water helps seal the dye in. It helps it, it helps the dye stay fast. It helps the dye stay. Um, you can also dye your fabric more than once. So you could dye it all a solid color, then do a dip dye. So just part of it is dyed a different color. There's lots of different techniques you can use. Other things you can do is after you've dyed something, you can go back in and draw on it with bleach, which will do what bleach does and bleach out the area and create a different kind of pattern. Um, you can also dip it in bleach after you've dyed it that will lighten it. You can use peroxide with it. Be careful, don't mix things that come from under your sink. Don't like go mixing different chemicals together and make uh, nerve gas. Be careful. I have a little illustration of that that I'll post on Blackboard, but read labels. Don't accidentally make toxic gas, please. Okay, so let's go back up here. Um, so for your dye book, um, here are the requirements. And I will also write these down in a document that is on Blackboard. But basically, you in your sketchbook, you're going to have 16 total dye book entries for the semester. Um, eight of those will be due at midterm, before midterm, when you turn in your midterm sketchbook. And the next eight will be due before the final. So um, for each entry, here are the requirements. You need to tape, staple, or stitch into uh, your page for each entry a plant-based fiber sample and a protein-based fiber sample. So cotton, like your cotton muslin, uh, wool, like your wool roving or your wool yarn, and you need to have tested both of those in the same dye process. Then you're going to write some information for me. You're going to say what the dye base is. You're going to say how much of the dye base you used. You're going to say how long it was, um, how long your samples were in the dye base and whether you used heat, whether you did not use heat. Some people in the past have experimented by putting things in the freezer or the refrigerator to see if that temperature affects it. That's all cool. Just tell me what you do. Whether or not you used a mordant, so whether you used vinegar or salt or something like this, um, and whether or not you rinsed it. Okay, so those are the requirements. If you're mixing dye bases, tell me which dye bases you mixed and what order you applied them. So basically, you just make a little log, like a scientist, of all the um, all the things you're subjecting the fabric to. So you will do that 16 times over the course of the semester. Okay, that is the dye book assignment.